Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the next in our series of client um, seminars uh, that the Workplace Law and Culture Group at Bardia Perry uh, produce regularly for you. Um, sorry, we're virtually appearing on the screen, but we're here live. And um, this seminar uh, being presented by uh, Linda McKinley and myself is Managing Workplace Safety, Discrimination, Harassment and Other Challenges in the New Era of Flexible Work and COVID-19. Um, now more than ever, employers are needing to adapt um, rapidly to changing COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, and as you've seen in New South Wales this week, um, it's happened uh, as, as early as yesterday. Um, and this has heightened employee concerns and created new challenges for the workplace. In this webinar, uh, Linda and I will be exploring with you the new challenges arising in managing concurrent duties um, of ensuring uh, flexible, fair and safe workplaces for everybody. Now, before we get started, um, just to let you know that we'll be sending you a recording of this webinar and the slides, so there's no, do, no need to ask. Um, but you can submit questions at any time uh, by typing the question in the questions and chat box that appears in the um, go to webinar uh, interface box and uh, to open the box you may need to press the arrow key to expand um, the chat function which is another little arrow at the bottom of that um, go to webinar panel. Um, we also want your feedback so please um, at, sit through and complete the survey that is at the end of the seminar. Um, we really value your input and particularly because it helps us frame uh, relevant and topical seminars such as this one. Um, we carefully read every uh, survey and make sure we address your questions and also do our best to ensure that the content that we deliver is exactly what you want to uh, hear about, not something we believe you want to hear about. So um, the survey is important. Well, let's get started. The agenda for today um, will be first We'll be starting to uh, look, ask you to nominate some of the challenges that you face as HR managers and workplace managers. Um, then through some uh, case studies and hypotheticals, but very closely based on real life examples um, that we have already come across this year in the workplace law and healthy uh, law and culture team of our office, um, we'll examine some of the tensions that have come about and exist with employees asserting their individual rights and so-called freedoms of choice and, and hold that up against social responsibilities that a workforce and employer organisation has. From this, we will look more closely at employer as well as employee responsibilities and the vexed question of how to exercise responsible decision making, particularly in um, what are considered in essential uh, industries, but also um, the more vexed question of um, vaccinations for broader industry types. Um, and then we will consider from what has been determined from some recent cases um, on uh, employees who exercise their freedom of choice, particularly in the context of not being vaccinated, of what's reasonably practicable for employers to protect against the risks of uh, COVID-19, but also other infectious disease risks um, and the transmission of those um, risks um, by the very nature that we're dealing with a virus that is indivisible, um, far reaching with serious consequences for infection. So let's go to the challenges. And this is a part where we'd like you to input um, your feedback. Um, so there's an ability during this seminar for you to input um, responses, so to make it a bit more interactive. The first question we have for you is, what are the more difficult HR challenges that you are facing in these COVID-19 times? Um, and there's a selection here of um, something to vote for. You've got 30 seconds to just click on one of those selections and we'll do a live poll. 
So the, the options are flexible work arrangements and, and the challenges around that being both office-based and home-based and also remote-based, um, so even offshore, unvaccinated workers and the challenge in um, seeking to have a fully vaccinated or um, near fully vaccinated workforce. Um, you may be noticing that there are segments of the workforce who have objection to uh, vaccination for whatever reason, and that's raising some challenges. Um, you also may have some vulnerable employees or workers, um, and there's also the mental health issues dealing with uh, particularly lockdown and isolation um, during COVID-19. Okay, so this is the responses we've got. Um, and interestingly, it's um, mental health that's the biggest challenge, and I'd probably agree that's certainly been my experience, but unvaccinated workers is the other big issue. So uh, that's interesting. All right, well, um, you know, of course, there's flexible work as well. Uh, but we'll, what we'll try and do is, in the case studies that follow, um, explore some of these issues and challenges with you. So um, on the next slide, um, I want you to imagine this. Um, a concerned employee of yours, Liz, has reported that she saw another employee of your organisation on the news, and that was last night. Um, she forwards, she actually then forwards to you by email a photograph that was picked up by the international news media, uh, which is uh, of interest to you because you didn't think it would be in the international news. And uh, it's a photograph of um, what appears to be a protest of Sydney ciders um, with the photographs shown there. Um, the photograph does indeed show a well-known and well-liked male employee of your organisation, Ben. And we're not showing his face in this photograph, but you do have the face shot. Um, ben has been photographed in a red T-shirt, as in the photo, and he's in a crowd of people, none of whom are wearing any face masks, uh, are gathering en masse, and, um, and apparently have no good reason to be disobeying stay-at-home orders that you know are in place. Um, he also appears to be in a crowd where, alarmingly, you notice another employee, Karen. Karen is holding up a rudimentary handmade sign uh, that says COVID-19 is a scam. Um, you're a little bit worried about this as well because um, Liz uh, has said that she has genuine work health safety concerns with Ben's return to work, uh, but you've also noticed Karen. Um, and Ben is actually rostered to return to work tomorrow. Um, so what do you do? <laughs> I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the structure and we'll get back to this and, uh, after some of the content that we'll be covering. Um, now, you also, after being shown this photograph um, of both Ben and Karen, uh, you do some online searching of your own to see if you can find anyone else in the organisation. And, uh, and you discover that Ben has quite a following on social media. Um, this is not what you've expected of Ben because uh, the reason he's well liked is he conducts the, usually the office yoga class in the office and he's really into healthy living. Um, and so this was a bit of a surprise because it appears Ben is a guru of other sorts as well, not just yoga. He is advocating a COVID-19 uh, infection is a government conspiracy online, and he believes vaccinations are a means of controlling people's lives. Um, and Ben also encourages his online followers to ignore um, public health orders, um, including by not wearing face masks, and by not staying at home when ordered and conducting your life as a free individual. Um, this is quite concerning to you because it appears that some of Ben's online followers are also other employees of the organisation. Um, one of these employees, Frank, um, surprises you because he's an older employee and he didn't actually know that Frank was onto social media at all. Um, but it surprises you more because Frank has a serious health condition of his own, which you only know about because he has medical restrictions that he's uh, not notified to you as part of a workers' compensation claim. And he's got 
uh, limited capacity to perform the inherent requirements of his job safely without special um, isolation and protective measures. Um, another employee online, Sarah, says she agrees with Ben, but not on his anarchal grounds. Um, Sarah is saying that because of her religious beliefs, uh, she does not identify with um, having to engage in vaccinations or um, staying at home and feels free that she should be able to congregate with, ever, with whomever she wishes. Um, so you've now got this collection of workers um, all within your midst um, and what do we do? So let's explore these themes as we go through the issues. Um, I should mention too, your organisation is particularly concerned um, and, and, and this is because um, it's well known for um, respecting diversity, but it also has some strict contractual obligations with the government to ensure not only that you comply with all government work health safety obligations, but you also ensure that you treat people uh, in accordance with anti-discrimination and equal opportunity laws. Good morning, everyone. Um, sounds like there's a minefield of issues there. I'm just going to step you through some of your responsibilities as an employer, your employees' responsibilities, and some of the risks and opportunities that you need to think about in terms of the new working relationships that you have as a result of COVID. So as an employer, you have overarching responsibilities to offer fair, safe, non-discriminatory, flexible, and certain workplace conditions. In terms of fairness, that's a duty to fairly treat employees in their employment. In terms of certainty, obviously it's very heightened uncertainty that we're currently experiencing. So it's important, we think, that employers provide as much certainty as possible for their employees. And this can be achieved by sharing information about your organisation and how it's responding to the pandemic, helping to ensure your employees have access to reliable and up-to-date information about the effectiveness of vaccinations and maintaining regular open communication with your employees. Safety, obviously it's a prime issue for you. You need to ensure the safety of your staff by assessing risks and implementing and reviewing control measures to prevent or minimise exposure to COVID-19 in your workplace so far as reasonably practicable. And this must be done in consultation with your workers. Flexibility is key here as well. You have a responsibility as a business to be flexible, which means not only facilitating flexibility around your working from home and other remote from work locations, but it's also flexibility in terms of hours of work and more flexible performance of work that acknowledges that many of your employees are facing challenges and circumstances because they, along with their families, are working from home remotely, and or undertaking remote schooling uh, if they've got children. And equity, for example, when you're considering how to manage your workplace in the current landscape, consider are there any decisions or policies that unexpectedly discriminate against employees or disproportionately impact or affect a section of your workplace more than another. So in terms of new working from home risks, we're now in an era where millions of Australians are working from home and will continue to do so for an extended period of time as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated restrictions. And this presents employers new working from home risks that may not have been previously contemplated and it requires you to re-evaluate the work health and safety obligations and responsibilities that arise in the context of working from home arrangements. So the risks of working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic are, of course, they're not just related to viral infection risks or whether someone has the safest appropriate equipment. They're also unique risks that you wouldn't usually have found in your workspaces. And one such unique risk is family and domestic violence. So the case of workers' compensation nominal insurer and Hill is the 2020 decision of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and it's an example of how the complex and difficult issue of domestic violence is a foreseeable risk associated with home-based work. Now in Hill, the Court of Appeal considered the question, can injuries sustained working from home, including death, be considered to have occurred in the course of employment? 
the Court of Appeal answered that question in the affirmative. By way of background, Ms Carroll and her partner, Mr Hill, were employed as financial advisors for a family company. Mr Hill was Ms Carroll's co-worker and also her supervisor. Both employees performed their duties from their home in New South Wales with Ms Carroll's two children. Mr Hill had paranoid delusions, which made him believe that Ms Carroll was conspiring with authorities to take his clients and ruin him professionally. And then one morning he acted on these delusions and he killed Ms Carroll. Ms Carroll's children made a claim for death benefits under the Workers' Compensation Act against the Workers' Compensation nominal insurer. And that was on the basis that death resulted from injuries sustained in the course of her employment with the family company. The Workers' Compensation Commission determined that Ms Carroll died as a result of injuries arising out of and in the course of her employment. And they ordered payments in favour of the two children. After lodging an appeal with the commission, which was subsequently dismissed, the insurer then lodged an appeal with the New South Wales Court of Appeal. Now the New South Wales Court of Appeal held that the death occurred in the course of Miss Carroll's employment because there was a connection between Mr Hill's delusions, Miss Carroll's employment and her death. As the death occurred between 8am and 10am, which was a time when Miss Carroll was either performing employee related duties or she was on call at the time of her assault and death. Ms Carroll's bedroom contained office files which supported the conclusion that the employee was working from her bedroom as early as 7.30 in the morning and during office hours while she took care of her baby. The New South Wales Court of Appeal observed the following principle. When determining if an injury was suffered in the course of employment, it's necessary to consider the temporal connection between the employment and the injury sustained. The course of employment extends beyond a worker's nominal, normal hours and place of work to the natural incidents connected with the class of work. Service is not confined to the actual performance of the work that the worker is employed to do, but includes all things incidental to the performance of that work. Unfortunately, COVID-19 restrictions have led to an increase in domestic and family violence, and employers should consider putting in place practices that encourage employees to confide and disclose any concerns, including any fears or concerns around domestic or family violence, so that you can look at risk prevention and management strategies to mitigate any liability. Now, in terms of new working in shared workspaces, risks and opportunities, that's also necessary to consider now that you've got these new um, arrangements as a result of COVID-19. And so, We'd like you to think about, are there any obligations to provide your, to provide alternative remote workplaces or workspaces for vulnerable employees? As circumstances relating to the pandemic change and they evolve, employees may wish to return to the physical workplace and or their roles. And there may also be a requirement for employees to gradually increase the level of their attendance at their usual workplace. Apparent risk to the employee's health in attending the workplace should be considered against the inherent requirements of their role and any mitigating strategies that can be put in place to reduce risk. So an example of this could include setting up mobile offices for, mobile, for vulnerable employees or moving a vulnerable employee to a role that doesn't involve face-to-face -face customer interactions. When identifying these mitigating strategies, the manager and the employee should also take into account factors such as whether there will be any increased risks to the employee through transport options if alternative work locations are being considered. Now, is your workforce made up of on-site and outdoor labour? Are there the same or different risks for each workplace? Is it necessary for you to require vaccinations to protect certain staff? This will obviously involve an assessment as there may be different infection risks attached to each workplace. And you may also need to consider if there are any award or enterprise agreement requirements that might apply. Now, the death of hot desking, question uh, mark. In the current and post COVID-19 landscape, working from home will be more accessible and utilised and there may be a reluctance to return to shared workspaces and the new workplace will perhaps be more virtual and less on employer premises. 
Employees and unions will seek to limit exposure to unnecessary risks associated with a full return to work in shared physical workspaces. But equally, employers will be looking at reducing office space requirements to limit financial exposure to high fixed workplace property costs. However, with the reduction in traditional office space, it may be that employers will need to manage more limited office space resources by revisiting hot desking and collaborative workspace, but just with greater hygiene and infection control measures. Now, the unspoken risks of a fully remote workforce without geographic boundaries. By allowing work to con be conducted remotely, employers are now also opening up your workplace to anywhere in the world. And so employers in high cost cities in Australia are no longer limited to high cost labour markets. And now that work can be done effectively almost anywhere, access to lower cost labour across the country and even around the world is now possible. And this could also herald a new age of outsourcing. It could also be assumed that there would be associated with this union demands to consult on available and skill local labour. Now I'll run through the employer responsibilities and some of the risks and opportunities of new working from home arrangements and new workspaces. But in terms of employee responsibilities, just as employers have responsibilities, so too do employees have their own responsibilities when it comes to work health and safety. And in these times, employers should be emphasising that workers too must discharge their important personal duties of care to prevent risks. So while at work, a worker must take reasonable care for their own health and safety, take reasonable care that their acts or omissions don't adversely affect the health and safety of other persons, comply so far as the worker is reasonably able with any reasonable instruction from their employer to comply with their work health and safety duties and cooperate with any reasonable employer policy or procedure relating to health or safety at the workplace. So now Darren will take you through some of these case studies. Right. I should say just on the tail of what Linda's mentioned, just think about Ken in the circumstances where he's intending to come back to work, he's exercising his individual rights to sort of protest. However, um, as an employer, you'd be entitled to say to um, Ken, um, well, what steps has he taken before returning to work to discharge his personal duties of care to consult with you about risks that he has exposed himself to and potentially the risks that he will expose other employees, particularly such as Frank. Um, so despite, um, and, and there's no need to get into why he was at a protest, it's more about his decisions that have exposed himself to a risk and whether or not he's discharging those responsibilities himself. But let's look at a different case study um, again, to sort of flesh out some of the issues dealing with essential um, industries, um, which some of which are not, don't immediately leap to mind, but in this case study, uh, which we've called Taking More Than Work Home, um, there's a bakery employee who's uh, responsible for both baking uh, goods and serving customers. Uh, and this employee, um, they have an ill partner at home who has multiple sclerosis. And you know that because the employees has shared that with you in um, a social setting. Now, now they are claiming that um, despite the need for you, you've got big, the biggest demand ever for baked goods at the moment. And in fact, you've needed to set up uh, extra rosters to deal with the demand for people eating lunch and breakfast and dinner at home. Um, unfortunately, this person now claiming they can't come to work at all. Um, because of COVID-19 outbreaks and the concerns that they have about infecting their partner at home um, uh, by bringing it home from serving customers. Um, the employee is claiming that they would like to take leave without pay um, and they don't want to take any annual leave, uh, which you find unusual and you're not quite sure um, why they're asking for that, but that's their demand. So. What do you think you can do? Well, we've got some options here. <laughs> um, so you might want to think about directing the employee to attend the work, um, but to manage the risks of uh, infection, bringing it home with the appropriate PPE, so not just masks, but perhaps 
face covering and extra hygiene. Um, you might want to have them not doing any customer service duties at all, but simply doing cleanup work or even helping in the back orders of online deliveries. Um, or you might be asking for a bit more evidence of the real risks of COVID-19 infection for somebody with multiple sclerosis. What do you think? All right. Yeah, I'm actually glad that the majority of you are saying um, you require better evidence of the risks. Um, I mean, I think that is an, a genuine uh, and an appropriate risk managed response because um, what we don't know is whether or not somebody, uh, whether there is any greater risk at all, for example, of um, somebody with MS being at risk. You presume it might be, but also, you know, is the household vaccinated? Um, or have they got in place um, infection control um, and risk management processes as a natural um, course because of them having that condition at home? Um, and in any event, how does it affect you when work is only done remote from the home? So I think all of the, it's a legitimate request um, to ask for that and, and quite appropriate. Um, now, what about the question about do you have to give them leave without pay? What do you think, yes or no? It might be, you might be thinking, well, there's no problem because we're not, it doesn't cost us anything. You also might be thinking, well, I'm a bit worried about this because why would an employee want not to be paid but to be off work? Wouldn't it be better to be accessing paid leave? Yep. Well, the answer is no, so that's that's right. Although um, there's nothing stopping you um, asking for whether they wish to access other types of leave. But um, the very nature of leave is that it's a permission system, so you're giving leave for somebody not to work, uh, but there's no absolute right to access leave without pay unless you've created one in your own policy or it exists by way of your industrial instruments. But usually it's not an absolute right. It's an entire, it's a discretion. Um, the one thing that you might, in you've interestingly found out because you've said to the employee, well, why is it that you're not wanting to access annual leave? And they tell you, oh, well, um, if we're all at home looking after the kids and I, I'm also looking after my partner with MS, we are entitled to extra Centrelink benefits to do so as carers. So um, that's something you didn't know, but you're also a little bit concerned because um, they actually are employed by you. It's just that they're on a form of unpaid leave, but uh, you're free to offer that unpaid leave. And in fact, that is the standard response for most people who are dealing with the situation. And in fact, employees are being encouraged to access whatever payments they can through government assistance. All right, we'll just move on now to um, the question of reasonably practicable. Um, and I think Linda, this is your slide, but if not, it's mine. <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's, it's um, with an invisible airborne menace, um, what we're dealing with is something that can be, you can be infected anywhere. Um, and so um, the question is, and this is sort of relevant for um, attempts going back to either um, the bakery employee or even Ken, um, is um, if Ken is insisting on coming back but you don't know um, what his infection status is, you'd probably be asking him to isolate. It would be reasonably practical to say to Ken, look, we expect you not to return to work because we're not sure um, what your infection status is. And, inf and in fact, we require you to provide evidence that you're not infected before you contemplate coming back to work. And a reasonable practical response would also be to um, perhaps ask him to isolate for at least 14 days and then provide evidence of a test. Um, but for others, um, uh, so the bakery employee, if you had thought about um, PPE, I mean, is it reasonable? 
would you be re reasonably practically expecting that employee to be wearing it on the full transit journey to and from work um, or even at home? Um, probably not at home, but certainly to and from work is a possibility and it would be consistent with ensuring that infection risk. Um, would you need to have extra equipment um, in terms of a customer facing role? Probably yes, and, and certainly you've noticed in most retail outlets now there is a perspex screen and other barriers. Um, you'd probably have in place an additional sort of enforcement regime of hand washing, social distancing, hygiene, um, but also looking at um, what have our what vulnerable employees do we have in the workplace? Have we got sufficient evidence or data about those employees? And how can we go about obtaining um, a better picture of what uh, vulnerable status we have in the workplace? If we're not sure, do we have anyone uh, in the workplace at all? And certainly during the current lockdown in Sydney, the answer is probably no, um, unless it's work that of course, the current lockdown rule is can work not be reasonably done at home. And so um, going back to the Hill case, if you've got an employee who says, at home I do not feel safe and I'm at risk of domestic violence, um, is it reasonably practicable to be requiring them to work from home? So um, that's putting it the other way around. It may be that with the absence of people in your office, or in your shared, there's no shared workspace at all, uh, it is safer for those vulnerable employees to be performing work for you during work hours when they're not at home. Um, but where you've got, for example, a refusal to work, um, such as the bakery employee, um, and as you responded, what are the real reasons supported by reliable evidence for them not to be able to comply with the requirement to work or a requirement to um, adhere to um, reasonably practical risk management um, measures such as uh, appropriate PPE or um, hand washing or hygiene um, regimens. Um, it may be the, fa the fact that an employee merely says to you, I don't feel safe or I think my um, uh, partner at home is not safe is probably not reliable evidence. And you may actually discover that, for example, um, the risk of somebody with MS being vaccinated can be managed and in fact the vaccination of his entire household and the worker would be a reasonably practicable measure uh, that you'd expect he would have taken himself personally as well as um, inviting him to do the same to at least mitigate based on what we currently know is the way of managing the risk of infection by for example by way of vaccination. Um, but those are some thoughts which we'll explore in a bit more detail, including with, um, just to get on to the next topic of um, vulnerable clients. Um, so um, in this setting, um, imagine that you're running a social service for clients with disabilities, um, and this uh, service provides short-term residential programs, as well as ongoing social inclusion programs for your clients. Now, in um, early 2021, which was on the back of what you knew were the risks emerging, particularly in the aged care sector for COVID-19, you, your board of your organisation um, implemented policy requiring all client-facing employees to have uh, several vaccinations, so not just COVID-19, but um, other vaccinations for uh, influenza and other um, highly uh, contagious or um, dangerous um, infectious conditions. Um, you had, um, you also had the foresight to, on pay review cycle on the 1st of July, to have all employees sign new contracts stating that they would be abiding by company policies and procedures as um, required and passed from time to time. Um, you now have a client facing employee who refuses to be COVID-19 vaccinated. And it's because they their reaction is, they say that they've had reactions to vaccinations when they were young. Um, and they have also suggested that they can get a doctor's certificate saying that they don't require to, um, to, to be vaccinated. Um, 
what can you do here? Um, one one um, sort of practical measure is will we simply just uh, warn the employee and tell them that they need to manage the risk appropriately, which includes compliance with the policy, reminding them of their personal duties to comply with um, reasonable employer health, work health and safety policy. The other option would be you simply suspend that employee until they say they can be vaccinated, and you could be you could find out that they actually are eligible to be vaccinated but haven't bothered to book, so you could be encouraging them to do so. Um, or the more drastic measure is you simply move to dismiss that employee for breach of a reasonable and lawful direction, um, that is to be vaccinated. Yeah, I think I think those responses indicate what I expected from a sophisticated audience such as yourselves in that um, a, a warn and manage approach is probably the um, appropriate one, although you you um, you may also have and this, the next option I think is 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 open to you as well um, to suspend them until they are vaccinated. But um, you'd have to be you'd have to make sure you have a right to suspend uh, with or without pay. So um, and of course if those measures don't work, it will probably be then moved to dismiss as the option. Now, what about those who this employee actually signed their contract? Do you believe that they've breached their contract um, in a fundamental way? So in, in a way that would entitle you to dismiss. Um, so yeah, those of you who might say yes would say, well, this is a fundamental work health and safe, safety obligation. Those of you who might select no might say, oh, well, look, um, ultimately they can choose whether they wish to do something. Um, I might get some further evidence about this concern they have about vaccination. Yeah, it's pretty close. Um, so it, it does depend on whether or not you've framed it as a fundamental obligation. And keep in mind too that um, you haven't, all you've said is that they will abide by company policies and procedures in their contract. But um, by abiding by it, you would expect that um, they're doing no more than complying with, for example, their personal duties under the Work Health and Safety Act, so Section 28, to comply with all reasonable and lawful directions to ensure not only their health and safety and that of others at work, but also that your organisation can comply with its work health and safety obligations. So there's probably both a statutory and contract um, ability to say, well, they're in breach of it. Whether that leads to um, dismissal is the more interesting question. What could be argued is that what the employee has done by refusing to vaccinate when you've required it to be done is that you could be suggesting that the employee has um, in legal, using legal language, repudiated their contract. That is, they have in, evinced an intention to no longer be bound by contract terms and um, or um, they are not intending to comply with a lawful and reasonable direction. Um, in that situation, in, under contract law, you have the right to, as the employer, to elect either to accept the repudiation, which then brings the contract to an end but not at your initiative, at the initiative of the employee, or you can elect to keep the contract on foot, but um, put in place measures to manage the employment relationship. So such as giving them a bit more time to be vaccinated or giving them a bit more time to provide you with evidence that um, they are at risk of some contraindication of vaccination. And there's there has to be another way of managing their condition at work. So. Um, I think that's, so the answer is yes, they probably have breached the contract. The question is, is it enough to bring the contract to an end? Um, you have the power to decide in that sense and that uh, you can take either avenue and, and uh, particularly in this role where you're running a social service for clients with disabilities, it's probably likely that you've got vulnerable um, clients where you have your duties of care to them are paramount. Um, as well as duties of care to other employees who might be at risk. But um, let's let's look at some some of, of what um, the recent cases say on this topic. 
and I'll hand it over to Linda. Thanks, Darren. So as um, that, so, that um, case study indicated, we've had um, before the Fair Work Commission a few cases, particularly from the aged care and early childhood sector around dismissals where there was a lawful and reasonable direction. And I'll just run you through some of the cases that have been recent. So as you would know, an employer may make and an employee must comply with lawful and reasonable directions. And so a direction that is not against the law is lawful. Where it becomes a little bit more difficult is whether a direction is reasonable. And that will depend on the circumstances of the business and of the employee. And a failure to comply with a lawful and reasonable direction may be a valid reason for disciplinary action, including the termination of an employee's employment. So the first case is Bo Jamie Barber and Good Start Early Learning, a 2021 case of the Fair Work Commission. And in this case, it concerned an early childcare educator who was dismissed after she refused to receive a flu vaccination for four months. A mandatory vaccination policy was implemented after her employer had considered the influenza risks to both the children at the childcare centre and also the other employees. The employee claimed that the mandatory vaccination requirement was akin to assault and battery, and she went on to assert that she should be exempt from the vaccination requirement as she had a sensitive immune system, yet provided no supporting evidence medically for that. The employer's vaccination requirement was held to be lawful and reasonable direction and the employee's failure to comply it justified her termination. In the decision, Deputy President Lake observed that the employer made a logical and legal analysis of the risks and hazards in the workplace and developed a response and implemented a policy to target the risk. The policy was a reasonable one and the applicant chose not to comply. No medical exemption was substantiated and accordingly, the applicant's employment came to an end. I'm satisfied, I'm not satisfied that that is unfair. In Kimber and Sapphire Coast Community Aged Care Limited, it's one of the, fir uh, the first aged care decisions, concerned an aged care receptionist who refused the influenza vaccination on the basis of a past allergic reaction. And her medical evidence, which she did have, but it was dated some 10 months after her alleged allergic reaction, and it didn't, in, didn't detail the contraindications experienced by her. At the time of the refusal, there was a public health order that was also in place, and that public health order prevented anyone who didn't have an up-to-date influenza vaccination from entering an aged care facility. So as such, the employee could not lawfully enter her workplace and couldn't fulfill the inherent requirements of her role. In Kuru and Cheltenham Manor, this is another 2021 decision of the Fair Work Commission. This was also involving an aged care facility based in Melbourne. And the facility had issued a direction that employer, employees would be divided into zones and were not to interact with employees from other zones without sufficient PPE. Uh, one month later after that direction, Ms Kuru and two other employees arrived at work 30 minutes before their shift and they smoked cigarettes in the parking area. And all three employees were from different zones. Uh, Ms Kuru was subsequently dismissed. Commissioner Yilmaz determined that not only was the direction to not interact a lawful and reasonable direction, but that the pre-shift interaction constituted a breach of a lawful and reasonable direction and was sufficiently connected with her employment and found that the dismissal was not unfair. The commissioner stated that the evidence that aged care facilities has been high risk is apparent. Therefore, healthcare workers have been the last line of defence against the virus. The risk to the aged is severe with a higher risk of death. The virus spreads easily, which is why PPE, social distancing and restrictions on mobility, including zoning of the facility, have been the mechanisms adopted by governments and employers. Ms Kuru gave evidence that she understood this. Her conduct, therefore, was sufficiently connected to her employment, even though it occurred before the commencement of her shift. The direct effect of her conduct had the potential to damage her employer's interests should there have been a contamination in that zone or across the other zones. 
Further, Ms Kuru's duties required her to care for the most vulnerable. Therefore, her own actions, albeit outside of work hours during a heightened period of the pandemic was in his opinion, incompatible with her role. The employee, employee's beliefs that COVID-19 was a conspiracy was also rejected. Uh, the last case is Glover and Ozcare, and this is a 2021 case in the Fair Work Commission. And it's one that the Commission gave its strongest endorsement in favour of vaccination yet. This case related to a home care assistant, Ms, Ms Glover, who was dismissed for her vaccination refusal. Her employer had induced, introduced a policy that required mandatory immunisation for all client facing roles from the 1st of May 2020, and it didn't permit any exemptions for medical issues, such as contraindications to previous vaccinations. Ms Glover refused to receive the vaccination as she claimed she'd previously suffered from an adverse reaction to the influenza vaccination. However, she didn't provide any evidence that supported this position. Ultimately, Commissioner Hunt found that not only was the introduction of the no exemption immunisation policy not unlawful, but requiring vaccination for client facing employees was a lawful requirement for continued employment. Significantly, Commissioner Hunt also found that the implementation of the immunisation policy was a valid exercise of managerial prerogative, especially given the vulnerability and age of the clients cared for by Ozcare, its employees and community care. The Commissioner also stated that Ozcare has not physically required any employees, including Ms Glover, to be vaccinated against their will. It has not held an employee down against their will and inflicted, inflicted a vaccination upon them. Now, as for whether the direction was reasonable, Commissioner Hunt found that it was, but relied on the following considerations. Ozcare's vulnerable and aged clients ought to be able to expect that every precaution would be taken against influenza by employees entering their homes. Ozcare may face criticism or legal challenge if an unvaccinated worker caused a vulnerable client to fall ill with the flu. Community care employees could become super spreaders of influenza as they may visit many clients' homes each day. Uh, the wearing of PPE alone is an insufficient safeguard to protect vulnerable community members. And Ozcare was entitled to implement policy and rely on mandatory vaccination in any litigation as an assurance to clients and their families as part of its commitment to safe and high quality care. Commissioner Hunt also accepted Ozcare's submission that in determining the reasonableness of the revised employee immunisation policy, it's necessary to do so against the background of managerial prerogative. The commissioner accepted that this is a decision the business considered necessary to take to safeguard its clients and employees as far as it's practicable to do so. So while these cases have largely been focused on the aged care and the early childhood sector, they provide guidance on how these situations will be treated because there's no doubt that given the evolving landscape around vaccinations, we'll start seeing cases from other sectors. So let's um, look at wrapping up and revisiting perhaps the original slide where we had, you, you might recall, um, we had Karen who was simply asserting that COVID-19 was conspiracy. I think the, um, certainly the decision of the Fair Work Commission, including uh, Kuru, helped um, establish that, um, uh, well, that conspiracy theory can be rejected and something that you don't have to be concerned about. But what about some of the other um, freedom of uh, choice issues um, or individual um, rights issues that um, some might claim. So, for example, you might recall again from the original slide, um, we had um, uh, Sarah who's claiming that she's got uh, religious beliefs that entitle her to object to um, a policy requiring vaccination or other um, sort of freedoms of um, movement or freedoms of expression. You've also got um, Ben himself, who is online expressing views that may not align with your organisational values. Um, how can you align that with your um, work health and safety and EEO obligations in terms of um, balancing, um, you know, a fair, flexible, safe and um, equitable workplace for all? Um, 
In terms of the legal answer, um, it's good to remember that work health and safety obligations uh, carry with them uh, criminal sanctions for breach, whereas um, breach of civil rights, not to say or diminish that those rights are any lesser, but um, they're not in the criminal uh, law sphere. They are civil um, sanctions where civil rights um, are proceeded with in the civil court. So um, there's always there's an immediate sort of paramountcy when you whenever you're dealing with something that's in the criminal sphere, where not only are you dealing with um, potential fines or imprisonment for um, for serious offences or repeat offences under the work health and safety legislation, but you're also dealing with um, a criminal record um, that you, your organisational senior managers may have to wear for the rest of their existence. And, and so I think you need to balance it in that context. Um, I keep in mind too that um, where you have people who express uh, a conscientious or religious objection, we've actually had seven of these cases already, um, three of which involved um, pseudo-religious or conscientious objection when evidence was requested of how that belief was supported. Um, uh, it couldn't be provided <laughs> um, and in fact they refused to on the basis of freedom of expression. So that in itself made it difficult to weigh it up um, but um, it was found um, well it was decided in no, each of those cases which all of which went to the Fair Work Commission that the, 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 the requirement to comply with a vaccination policy which was not just directed at COVID-19 it was also directed at influenza and most of those cases as Linda's touched on deal with actually influenza infection um, as well as COVID-19 they were lawful and reasonable policies and were proportionate to managing a serious risk of health and safety to clients but also vulnerable co-workers so this is the other concept to move away from um, what you're doing as an employer is not measuring or managing or in any way interfering with um, a private right because those rights are exercised outside of the workplace um, ordinarily. You're dealing with matters within your control where work is being performed. Now, of course, it might be an issue if Ken, for example, is using work time to espouse his views on um, vaccination, um, but that could be dealt with, um, for example, within your um, IT policies or proper use of um, uh, time when, when um, working as an employee versus personal time. Of course, this is all very difficult when people are working from home and switching between a personal um, mode and work worker mode, but you're certainly entitled to delineate and enforce reasonable and lawful policy. Um, it's also important to sort of um, remember that um, just as employees have a statutory obligation to ensure that they do not expose themselves, whether it be because they're unvaccinated or otherwise, or meeting uh, like Ken did in a mass meeting without protection, um, but they also have a statutory obligation to look after the health and safety of other workers and also other people, so your clients and, um, uh, and customers. Um, and if they are unable to do that, they're in breach of those duties. There's also inversely a statutory right for the unvaccinated. So Liz is the person, remember at the beginning of the, the slide, Liz was the one who was concerned about coming to work because of um, Ben um, being the infected or potentially infected person. She would have a right to refuse to perform work if it was in proximity of Ben and certainly um, if we go back to Frank, who's the vulnerable employee, he'd have a particularly um, good reason not to be in proximity of Ken or, or Karen for that, that reason. Karen was the one who held up the conspiracy sign. They were both potentially exposed to infection. Um, you also have the issue of um, um, employees who might claim to be especially vulnerable, such as those um, as we explored in the case study with um, a partner who's got 
a disability or, or such as multiple sclerosis, uh, lupus, or, or some other disability that may, might make them, their, their Muslims, their partners vulnerable. Um, or um, what we're noticing now is people claiming that being a pregnant employee places them at risk. Um, all that you can do as a reasonable employer is, is rely on the evidence of experts who are qualified to give you um, an opinion. Uh, the danger here is not to leap to conclusions or make up your own minds about risk. You need to get um, reliable evidence based on um, an opinion of someone who's qualified to give you um, a, a, an evidentiary basis for risk that you can rely on. Um, now, interestingly, with those who, and I'm going back to, you know, Ken, if he says he has some conscientious objection on freedom of choice grounds, um, as I've said, you could deal with that in terms of your um, organisation policies, values, um, code of conduct, um, and the High Court decision in Benaria is a good example of where, um, certainly in a public service context, it's expected that um, employees are, are good, faithful, and do not um, express opinions that may um, be at odds with or contrary to organisational values and policy, or could be contrary to um, the uh, public image and reputation of your business. So um, there are limits on what could be said and you could act on it. In terms of um, religious grounds, keep in mind that in, for example, in New South Wales, uh, certainly the Anti-Discrimination Act does not even deal with religion as a ground of discrimination. However, if it was asserted that it was at a federal level or under a state, other state um, statute, um, the, we don't have much guidance yet, but there is a decision that's been handed down in the United States, and it's the Court of Appeals Fifth Circuit. Um, that involved a uh, fire brigade employee who um, worked for, um, it was the fire department at the city of Leander in Texas. Um, that fire department implemented a new policy requiring um, vaccinations um, to deal with the list the risk of COVID-19 infection and other infectious diseases. The employee there who was a driver pump operator on a fire truck um, objected to the vaccination, but that was on the grounds of his um, relig religious tenets um, of his religion. Um, and, and indeed the, that religion uh, surprisingly was a Baptist um, religion. Um, the department gave him a choice, however, that he was free to exercise that religious choice, um, but or, um, he had to either transfer to a different job um, or um, and not be vaccinated or simply um, leave the service. Um, the Court of Appeals in the US found that um, there had been some reasonable accommodation for his objections. Uh, which was a, an issue there. However, um, his dismissal was lawful because that's what happened uh, in that um, the um, requirement to be vaccinated was seen to be a reasonable management um, action to uh, prevent from serious illness or even fatality um, in dealing with uh, uh, an essential service role. Um, so that, that US decision may or may not be instructive for Australian employers, but um, it seems unlikely that religious grounds would be um, sufficient or other conscientious objection grounds, uh, but you could deal with it in policy accordingly. Um, what's important to remember though, is that regardless of um, the, the beliefs, motivations or um, anxieties that may be driving employers, employees to um, not um, fully engage or comply with your policies, um, it's important to remember there's concurrent shared duties to consult and manage risk. So of any um, any risk, the risk of COVID-19 infection is, is probably the prime example of where employees probably have uh, just as many duties or as higher duties of care as an employer does in that they could be anywhere um, out, in or outside of work, be infected, not know it, 
um, and then inadvertently trans be transmitting it um, at work without anybody knowing it. Um, and so um, the duty of care is, um, again, not uh, it's not a duty that goes to the actual um, sort of consequence of infection. It's actually to protect against the risk of infection. So uh, work health and safety, again, is a good guiding light because it's all about proactive, reasonable measures or what's reasonably practicable to prevent risk. And uh, one way of doing that is to ensure that you have um, active um, consultation that's two ways. It's not just one way communication. You need your employees to be telling you as much about what their risks are, as well as what you perceive them to be in terms of managing those risks. Um, and, um, and again, I think if you put it in the context of what the overriding statutory obligations are in a criminal uh, sanction setting, um, that is um, what we see as a guiding light in terms of managing um, these sort of um, interesting and intersecting rights and obligations, but ultimately um, the risk of serious illness or death, I think, is something that um, is, is certainly weighs on most people's minds and it's a reasonably practical um, sort of guiding light um, offered by the work health and safety law, um, which is consistent with um, what, for example, disability discrimination law or um, other discrimination laws require you to do in terms of um, reasonableness, in terms of requirements. If you've got a requirement or condition um, at work that affects people, is it reasonable in all the circumstances? Um, and that reasonableness, again, would be grounded on um, ensuring health and safety of your um, workers themselves and customers and clients. Well, I think that, that sort of wraps up what we were hoping to cover in this session. Um, I'm not sure, Linda, whether we've got any questions um, that have come through on the chat. Um, uh, I think on one, of the, one of the questions we have is if an employee is going through immunosuppression treatment, that is chemo and has been advised at this time, and whilst on treatment they cannot have the vaccine, how do you enforce this contract and protect the employee and other staff? Um, yep. I think it's sort of goes back to what we were discussing around vulnerable employees and assessing whether there are other ways for them to work, whether it's working from home. Um, do you look at some type of um, separate zone, similar to what was discussed in the Kuru and Cheltenham Manor um, decision? Can you look at some type of um, mobile remote workspace? Um, they're sort of the kinds of options that I can see right now. Yeah. It's a good question and it probably, it's a good example of why you would not be moving to dismissal, but treating it as um, uh, an intention or an inability to perform the contract. So um, if you look at it from a contract law point of view, um, here the employee is um, not unwilling, but unable to um, comply with the contract term, um, that is to be vaccinated, but they're also unable to perform work, you would think, or if they are able to perform work, it's in between um, those um, chemo sessions. Um, that would be where you would need to consider whether they can safely perform the inherent requirements of the job. And um, from a contract law point of view, rather than electing um, to accept repudiation, you might elect to keep the contract on foot for a reasonable period of time until such time as you'd be, um, it could be that they're at the end of their treatment and the prospects of full recovery are good. Um, and there may be a way of managing the risk. Or if, for example, this employee is front-facing um, client role um, and whether it was COVID-19 or some other risk of infection, it's the same risk, are you able to um, take reasonable practical steps to accommodate or adjust um, their, the, the essential duties of their role to enable them to do it safely without risk to themselves other colleagues or patients and it, the answer to that could be yes you could um, in that there, there could be certain roles you could assign to them um, that ensure that they are not exposed to the risk whether it be um, a limited um, like the bakery example where um, there's some back office work that could be done by them competently at least for a short term um, 
so that they would be not exposed to risk. But ultimately, if, if there's an in, indefinite period of risk that you can't manage reasonably, um, you might have to consider whether or not you can continue the employment contract um, on reasonable practical grounds. Um, that would be a difficult choice, but it's also another option. Uh, there are quite a few questions, but I note the time, so it may be that we um, get back to those. Do, that one more and we get back to, yeah, do one more and we'll get back to everyone else. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one of the questions, it's um, the FWO has recently updated its guidance regarding vaccines, advising that employers and employees are encouraged to take a collaborative approach as the vaccine rollout continues and availability increases. However, the OAIC continues to advise that your employer can only require you to provide information about your vaccination status in very limited circumstances and must comply with the APPs, particularly APP3. What are your views on reconciling a requirement, contractually or policy-based, to have employees vaccinated when the OAIC still considers vaccination status as sensitive information and is afforded protections under APP3? Yep. Um, it's a good question, but it's also important to remember that those two bodies have very particular functions. And so um, in terms of privacy, um, whilst it might be an issue of privacy, um, what you're not requiring employees to do necessarily is disclose their medical records to you. What you're requiring them to do is to consult with you about risk. So this is to reconcile it's actually a changing view of the Fair Work Ombudsman and also Safe Work Australia about what's reasonably practicable. I think as we've noticed in the last week, um, Safe Work Australia and Fair Work have actually realised that more can be done that's reasonably practicable, including vaccinate uh, workforces that may not be just essential service um, industry workforces. Um, so, in terms of not complying with privacy law or disability discrimination law, for that matter too, um, whilst you are, um, you shouldn't be demanding or directing employees to disclose to you their medical record or disability, what you are certainly lawfully entitled to do is to direct an employee to consult with you and to share with you the risks that they have of being infected. So um, that in itself, um, if they, and you would need to be, uh, if you're not satisfied on reasonable grounds that they've given you sufficient information, um, then you would need to be making a decision based on um, risks that you are not aware of that can't be managed. So um, if, for example, an employee is simply refusing to tell you um, whether or not they are at risk of infection, um, which might indicate, it may not indicate that they're vaccinated. In fact, the mere fact that you were vaccinated, whether it be um, an initial shot or the, or the second booster shot, um, and we're even talking now about third shots, <laughs> um, is not an indication of um, immunity. It's simply an indication that they may be at lower risk of infection themselves or uh, lower risk of uh, ill health because of infection. Uh, but the same risk might attach to um, them transmitting infection, um, as well as them being infected by someone else who's not vaccinated or is vaccinated. So you're not, you, what you're requiring them to do is consult with you about risk. So if they cannot give you any um, satisfactory explanation about why they are at lower risk or their ability to comply with a safe work environment, for example, they might say, well, look, I'll naturally um, manage it because, you know, um, I've been given the gift of um, healing myself. Um, if I get vaccinated, it's, it's, uh, that's an infringement of my body and rights to manage my own illnesses myself. I don't think you'd have a high degree of confidence that um, that would be a sufficient um, uh, way of managing risk. So. Um, yes. I might, I might also add that um, you could potentially collect that inf information or that health information if you could demonstrate that it was reasonably necessary or direct, directly related to um, one of their functions or activities or to prevent or manage COVID-19 in your workplace. Yeah. 
Um, one, I should say here, what we found was interesting with a couple of cases we've had is employees were, including some who were conscientious objectors, um, they were happy, however, to provide medical state certificates in the past of vaccinations that they needed to have when they travelled overseas to Thailand. So um, <laughs> you might want to query what, why they were, why they're now suddenly reluctant when in the past, when they asked for a, a time off um, to get in, um, in vaccinations for diphtheria or malaria or typhoid, why that was okay, but now it's any, it's different. Um, and you, again, you'd probably take a, a cautious approach if they uh, simply refused. Well, yes, that's probably all we have, time we have, unfortunately, but what we will do is we'll get back to those questions that we've been asked. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been, um, it's a shame we can't see you in person, but um, this is just as good. Um, may you stay safe. Um, hopefully your, your business and organisations will be managing these challenges as best they can. And remember that um, uh, the workplace law and culture team, uh, particularly uh, Linda and I are available to help you at any time um, should you have um, the urgent need for advice or assistance. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.